Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. I'm your host, Stephen Pinecker, and here's my bud, Jonathan Neville. Back, to, Welcome back, sir. Happy to be here. So Jonathan's doing a real solid. We're going to be uh, doing some more of these Tuesday, kind of like the Brent Ashware show and tell, or are we going to talk about different topics and subjects? So it's kind of a little bit more open than uh, than what we're doing with Brent. But people have been giving me great responses on both Brent's uh, stuff as well as Jonathan. So I thought, let's have Jonathan back. And Jonathan, uh, of course, you wrote the book, Infinite Goodness, uh, Joseph Smith, Jonathan Edwards, and the Book of Mormon. And uh -huh. uh, you did a lot of research uh, about Jonathan Edwards, and you came yeah. across some interesting materials, and you wanted to share a particular uh, set with me. So uh, tell me about it. Okay. Well, you know, as, as I went through the Jonathan Edwards stuff, we've, we've talked about how I got into it. And I was curious to, to know what Joseph Smith would have actually encountered with Jonathan Edwards. And so as I was doing the research, I found that the 1808 set of Jonathan Edwards works, it was eight volumes. It's easy to remember, eight volumes, 1808. And, and they were on sale in the Palmyra bookstore that he used to go to every week. And so I, I got on the internet and I was finding some references but it was hard to tell if they were in that 1808 edition. And so I, I got on um, eBay and actually bought a, an 1808 set. This is one volume from it, volume seven. Oh. I know you like books, so there you go. This is, uh, I don't know if you can read that or not, but it says Edwards, President Edwards, I think it says. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. And this is volume seven. Okay. And so I, I bought these and they cost about $1,000 or something, you know. And then I, I started reading through it here. This one was from, um, actually, this is from the Library of the Theological Seminary of the Diocese of Ohio, if you can see that. Okay. That was the origin of it. Interesting, excellent. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty cool. And so I, I started going, just kind of going through it. And in the process of, of doing it, there's a little inscription and so on. I, I realized that um, I would do these word searches for phrases and keywords and things. And I, I also found this on Kindle, by the way, the 1808 edition on Kindle. But sometimes I would notice there was a problem with the Kindle digitization where a word didn't make sense. And so some of the, the letters weren't transcribed correctly in the Kindle. But I also was introduced to the um, Jonathan Edwards Center at Yale which has an extensive database of Jonathan Edwards. And I would do word searches that I found in here, but not in the Yale database. And I, I, uh, Richard Bushman introduced me to the people at Yale. And so I contacted them and I told them they have a, a major defect in their database because much of this 1808 edition was not digitized. And they hadn't realized that. And so the, in the process, he said, they, they told me that they're uh, reworking their whole database of Jonathan Edwards. And so they're going to make sure they include this whole 1808 edition in there. Because it's partly some of the sermons in here were not in the Yale database, but also some of the editorial content. So I'm just going to give you a quick example of why this is kind of cool. <laughs> because the, the famous sermon that... Um, I talk about in King Benjamin's address, National Man is an Enemy to God. So this was the sermon that says, I don't know if you can read this. It says, men naturally God's enemies, right? Uh -huh. And much of this uh, sermon goes on and on and explains how the natural man is an enemy to God, which King Benjamin never really explains. He just uses the phrase and then explains how to overcome the natural man. And so if a reader of the Book of Mormon has to kind of create their own idea of what he meant by natural man is an enemy to God, but it was an allusion to the Jonathan Edwards sermon. So when you take the Jonathan Edwards sermon as an expansion of what uh, King Benjamin taught, then you really have a deeper understanding of the whole concept and why King Benjamin said what he said. Now, in my view, of course, jo uh, Joseph Smith translated what King Benjamin actually said, and put it in the language he was familiar with which was from Jonathan Edwards so and I've given the analogy before that the Book of Mormon refers to the law of Moses but doesn't ever explain it and it's the same way the, the Book of Mormon alludes to Jonathan Edwards but doesn't elaborate on it and and that's why for me understanding Jonathan Edwards here 
has just opened up the Book of Mormon tremendously, just like reading the Old Testament and understand or expands your understanding of the Law of Moses. Well, one of the fascinating things about this particular thing that you would not get if you were looking at a database is the opposite page. See what that says there? Joseph's Temptations. Uh-huh. Okay. Can you read that? Yeah, Joseph Tempta Joseph's Temptations. Yeah. Okay. This is really interesting. And because the sermon that precedes it in this book is all about Joseph in Egypt. I'm just flipping through the pages here mm -hmm. to get to the beginning of it. But so here it says, um, I'll show you this in a sec, but this Sermon 11, Joseph's Great Temptation. Um, you, you can see where that's the name of the sermon. Uh-huh. Joseph's Great Temptation. Well, I started annotating this with the Book of Mormon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I've told you before that I have, my interest was in the non-biblical language in the Book of Mormon. And so I, I made a list of all the terms and the phrases and everything that are not biblical that are in the Book of Mormon. And the beginning of this sermon about Joseph's temptations has several of the non-biblical Book of Mormon terminology in it. What this indicates to me, this, this is how I, how I envision this happening. Joseph going through these uh, sermons, because the, the guys working in the bookstore said he was uh, there all the time, you know, and he sees one, Joseph's great temptation. Naturally, that would kind of pique his interest, right? Mm -hmm. Joseph Smith, you know, he'd say, well, what was Joseph's great temptation? So he reads this whole chapter, talks about Joseph in Egypt, and the very next one, the next sermon, which is sermon number three, the first Joseph in Egypt was sermon two. I said 11, but it was really two. Sermon three is men naturally are God's enemies. So now I have two sermons in here next to each other that are both full of Book of Mormon, the non-biblical Book of Mormon language. And of course, if, as you study Joseph Smith, you know there were several times when he talked about Joseph in Egypt and the Book of Mormon itself does too. So I just found that as a, this is just real preliminary research. I haven't written about this or published about this yet, but I wanted to show you that the advantage of actually going to the original book and putting yourself in Joseph Smith's place as a young seeker and reading through these things and seeing why these, some particular sermons would have a special appeal to them. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's the advantage of keeping old books. Yeah, yep. <laughs> and, right. and doing a little forensics, you know, you put yourself in Joseph Smith's place. What in these sermons of Jonathan Edwards would particularly appeal to him? And I think the one with Joseph's temptations would stand out. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wanted to mention, is... something. I don't know if you have any other questions about this, but it's a, it's a really interesting new approach to doing the research. Yeah, I, I personally think that when, I, when, I, when, you, when we first started talking, and you told me about the book that you were about ready to publish. And I was just thinking, this is truly fascinating to me. And, and the reason why is like, I tell people, so, you know, it doesn't really matter if it's a 19th century production or if it's an ancient production. The key thing is, is that the Book of Mormon is a place where both evangelicals and members of the restoration can have common ground and conversation. Absolutely. Yep. Exactly. And I had Casey Kern, Okay, was one of my previous guests gave a great presentation on the atonement in the Book of Mormon, and he he went and started delving and researching Jonathan Edwards. Mm -hmm. uh, I know of other people that have contacted me, and so and and this is the yeah. this is the thing that I find so interesting is that often Jonathan Edwards was used as the boogeyman as an example of what we yeah. aren't, and you're right. saying that no Jonathan Edwards has been with us from the start. Yeah, and, and let me show you something else that's really interesting. I'm sure you're familiar with this book, right? B.H. Roberts, The Book of Mormon. Oh, yeah, I got my own copy. Okay, you got your copy there. Well, you can go to, I think it's page two, let's see, what is it? 298, he has a long discussion about Jonathan Edwards in here. Oh. It's about 10 pages of quoting Jonathan Edwards. Yeah. <laughs> and his, his point is that the, the Book of Mormon talks about uh, spiritual manifestations where people are overcome and so on physically overcome and he points out he, he goes at length reciting the account of sarah edwards who famously had an evangelical experience and when jonathan edwards returned home and found out that she had had this experience he was overjoyed and so on because he had felt she hadn't been very religious you know and that's a i talk about that quite a bit in the infinite goodness book because 
uh, that whole incident has been misconstrued by several LDS scholars. And so I explained how, why they took it out of context and how it fit their narrative, but it was inaccurate the way they portrayed it. But B.H. Roberts used it as to show the context that Joseph Smith was would have been exposed to. And he implies that Joseph was familiar with Edward's writings, whether directly or through sermons and other ministers. But I, I was it's just very striking to read through this and see how extensively B.H. Roberts talked about Jonathan Edwards. Mm. And I, I, you know, that's just another thing. And I, I know, you know, many people have noticed a similarity between the Book of Mormon and Edwards and other evangelical uh, sermons. But no one, is, as far as I know, has gone through the detail and really isolated Edwards as the primary influence next to the Bible. I, obviously, the Bible's the biggest influence, but Edwards was number two. And number three was probably James Hervey, which I haven't really published much about yet. But um, yeah, you're right. It's, a, it's an opportunity for evangelicals and other restorationists, including Latter-day Saints, to find unity of, of interest and purpose even. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, th I think it's awesome. I mean, I just love it. So I tell me what you thought of Jonathan Edwards. What, what were your thoughts? Who, who did you think Jonathan Edwards was and what he represented before you started researching him? Well, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God was the sermon mm -hmm. that I knew about, right? Mm -hmm. I thought he was fire and brimstone, you know, all this kind of stuff. And then when I started reading what he actually wrote instead of what people said he wrote, he's always been taken out of context, really. Even that sermon, for example. That sermon is so has such vivid imagery that people latched onto that as emblematic of everything Edwards wrote. But it isn't, you know, it's not really even representative. In fact, he he made the statement that I don't even want to be framed as a Calvinist because he said, I I read what Calvin said, and I consider it, but I have my own ideas, you know, and so he's been pigeonholed as a strict Calvinist, you know, and all that, but when you read what he actually said, he's not, he even talked about eternal marriage with his wife and things, you know, so, um, well, I, as you know, from reading the book, I think he was like the Elias for the, the restoration through Joseph Smith, and lots of people were talking about a restoration, and restoration of all things, and so on, but the, the Book of Mormon really did it, fulfill, I guess, the aspirations that Edwards had for the church. So that's why I love it. And, and I, you know, I've, I've been trying to introduce Edwards to the LDS community. That's why I had some passages or some of his sermons in my book, so people could read it for themselves. I even have a blog, it's, it's called Your Daily Jonathan Edwards. <laughs> and I, I, I put excerpts from him that relate to LDS topics. And I, I, I started doing it daily and now then it was monthly and now it's haphazard, you know. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of people that read that just because they've never heard about Jonathan Edwards. And you know, on my on the uh, Museum of the Book of Mormon webpage, mobom.org, we have a section on Jonathan Edwards as a way to introduce him to the LDS community. That's just fantastic. Now tell me about this uh, Jonathan Edwards Center at Yale University. Yeah, okay. That it's a uh, of course, he was a graduate of Yale, right? He married the daughter of the founder of Yale. So he was very closely connected to Yale. So I think it was, I can't remember the day, you know, 20, 30 years ago, they decided to do a digitized kind of compilation of all Edwards works. And it's just called um, Edwards. Uh, I, don't, I think it's edwards.yale.edu is their site, but you can just Google Jonathan Edwards Center. And they have all his works, except for the ones that I identified that aren't in their database, which they're adding. For example, this sermon on men naturally are God's enemies wasn't in their database. Hmm. So it's, it's kind of understandable why people didn't really discover it, I guess. But um, they have uh, some biographical information about him. They have some treatises about different aspects of his life and so on. It's, it's just a phenomenal center. But you might be interested in this. When I when I first was talking with Richard Bushman about all this, he said that I came 15 years too late. And I said, what do you mean? He said, when they started the Joseph Smith papers, they had uh, collaborated with the Jonathan Edwards Center because they, that was kind of like the epitome of uh, scholarly internet in integration. And one of the, the directors of the Jonathan Edwards Center is still on the Joseph Smith papers today as an as a, associate editor or 
collaborator of some sort, but he's listed in the, the credits. And he said that at the time they had considered doing a combined database between Jonathan Edwards and Joseph Smith, but they didn't really see much of a connection. Mm. And now the connection is so obvious. Mm. It, you know, I, I, it's one of these things where I report and you decide, you know, so mm -hmm. people have, I know I have critics that say, oh, I'm just trying to show Joseph Smith wrote the Book of Mormon because he was just copying Jonathan Edwards, which is exactly the opposite of what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Critics love to take your words out of context and so on. But it's exciting now because the Edwards um, Center is already involved with the Joseph Smith papers. And so there is a potential now to have a more, uh, should I say, more academic or more qualified or more reputable integration of Jonathan Edwards and Joseph Smith than just my little proposal. Now, you know, I you, you mentioned the book. I have an extensive database that I couldn't even touch in the book. And I have a lot more material. I could, I could publish probably two or three more volumes on it. But eventually we're going to put that in a format where I can put that on the internet so that any reader of the Book of Mormon, if they have a, a question about a particular phrase, they can go to the database and see how Jonathan Edwards used that term or that phrase. Mm. For example, the continual scene of wickedness, you know, there, there's phrases like that that Joseph used when he was translating the Nephite record. And so it, it makes sense when you just read it, but when, like the one with the natural man as an enemy to God, there's many phrases like that that have much more expansive meaning when you understand how Joseph Smith learned those phrases and the context. Hmm. So it's an, it's an exciting time. I mean, you yeah. know, there's, there's just only so much time to do things, but um, almost daily, I add to that database too. It's incredible. It's yeah, it's, it's really fun. It's so amazing how, you know, you know, people ask me, how is it that you, you know, you're just focusing on Mormonism. And I said, and are you going to run out of things? I said, no, every day there's something new. <laughs> yeah. There's new yeah. research, new ideas, new ways of looking yeah. at things. What I love about it is that here you are kind of like me, this outsider, nobody, yeah. <laughs> nobody's ever heard of, just got to fall into this world and cause ripples. And cause yeah. people to take attention, you know, like, hey, I, I think Jonathan's onto something. And there's been, you know, I've had conversations with people about your work. And I just think how when I was at the Mormon History Association last June, and I had mentioned how I'm engaging, you know, uh, no, nobody, like I, I mentioned your name, and most people hadn't heard of you. But right. I said, well, he's a Heartlander, but he's got this really, oh, Heartlanders, ah, blah, blah, you know. <laughs> and, <laughs> I know. And, yeah. and I was yeah, like, that's awesome. But I thought this guy's onto something. And I think what it was, it's this was this kind of special convergence is here I am starting this little channel yeah. and evangelical encounters the restoration. And here you are, you're doing research where Joseph Smith encounters Jonathan Edwards. Yeah. And I think that it was yeah. the perfect storm for us to come together. You're right. And perhaps because I'm an outsider and I'm an evangelical, I'm like, wait a second here. This mm -hmm. is interesting to me. So I, I just yeah. think that this journey that you and I have been on for about a year now has been absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And I think that when you, it was just very exciting to me to think of these thinking outside of the box, hearing different voices, different opinions, and looking at the text in a different way. I think that if people, because this is the idea, if, 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 if the natural man is an enemy to God, actually has an idea a con is, is based on something so if joseph is encountering the text and he's he's translating who knows what the phraseology is except oh yes natural man's enemy god i know this yeah. this is exactly what this is so then yeah. we got to just hit not just the phrase but everything that's in that in the sermon in the yeah. ideas of jonathan edwards you got to also look at and investigate as well yeah so i i look at it as the book of mormon is a condensed version of the gospel and a simple phrase like national man is an enemy to God has an expansive meaning. And, and people who are familiar with Edwards knows what that is. But if you don't, it's just like I, I give the analogy of, of someone in China reading the Book of Mormon. It says the law of Moses. Is that traffic law, you know? <laughs> is it a law about how to deal with your pets? No one has any idea what the law of Moses is. And so you have to teach them about the background of the Old Testament, what, who was Moses and so on. And it's the same now with the Book of Mormon. We can look at that and it's we can unpack that that condensed little suitcase of natural man as an enemy to God. And just reading Edward's sermon, you can see exactly why Joseph chose that phrase to translate what King Benjamin was saying. 
and then it means so much more. It's, it's just amazing. Yeah, yeah. So people should read King Benjamin and also read Jonathan Edwards. Yeah. And then I think that gives you a fuller picture. Well, that's, that's only one example. The entire book of Mormon is this way. Yeah. There's so many phrases and concepts that when you, when you read it in, through the eyes of Joseph Smith, reading this 1808 book, you know, how, why did he choose those phrases? And when you read the original source of those phrases and, and terminology, then you get a much more expansive meaning of it. By the way, you mentioned Mormon History Association. So in June of this year, 2022, I'm going to be speaking at Mormon History Association about Jonathan Edwards in the Book of Mormon. And as the main topic is sort of uh, Jonathan Edwards as an Elias and his concept of um, America as this, as the location of the restoration, those kind of things that he wrote about. I alluded to it a little bit in the book, but I'm going to expand on that. So anyone listening who comes to Mormon History Association, come and hear me talk about Jonathan Edwards. I'm on a panel with two other awesome scholars and who have different aspects of it, not Jonathan Edwards, but different aspects. And so we're kind of integrating these, these ideas, but it'll be open to question and answer as well. So I look forward to that. I'll be there. Can't yeah, wait. Be fun. Very exciting. Um, this this will be my second appearance at Mormon History Association. So that's great. Usually I'm out of town. There's no way I can attend, you know. But this year we are going to be here. So that's great. Well, I'm so happy yeah, that you're doing that, uh, Jonathan. I want to thank you so much for coming onto the program today. Mm -hmm. Happy to be here. I appreciate it every time. Yep. Love so, your well, channel. Thank you. Well, folks, I just want to stay tuned, Jonathan. This will be a, an irregular series where Jonathan will pop in now and then. Not, not only will we do long form interviews, but we're also going to be doing these Tuesday segments that are like 20, 30 minutes where we talk about topics and stuff. I just mm -hmm. want to remind my audience to like and subscribe. Don't forget, we do have a Patreon page for those of us who, those of you who would like to support our channel financially. You can reach me at mormonbookreviews at gmail.com. Don't forget, we're all on, on the Apple, Spotify, and Google podcast platforms. And uh, just be well, everybody, and have yourself a wonderful day.